the unthinkable happened. More than two weeks ago, Donald Trump was almost assassinated, and everybody in the world has probably heard about it, including you. I am not going to uh, tell you more about the reports. That is not the purpose of this uh, presentation. There are many theories, there are many stories into what has happened, but I'm going to let the experts and the politicians deal with this enormous thing of Donald Trump had almost died. He was almost killed two weeks ago. Instead, what I want to look with you is the future of America. Because there were two particular things when I was watching, together with my wife, the event unfolding with the assassination attempt of Donald Trump. The first thought that I had when I saw him, as you see here on the picture, as he was waving his hand and then there was the American flag flying behind him, I was thinking to myself, he won the election. If he is going to survive until November the 5th, he is going to win the election. No doubt about it. But then the second thought that came to my mind after a couple of minutes as I was contemplating on what has happened was that probably we had the first shooting in the Civil War. Now, if you have paid a little bit of attention of American politics and how things have been unfolding in the past couple of years, there has been this talking and talking about the coming Civil War. And I was thinking to myself, well, Trump didn't die, and that's a good thing. Who, who knew what would have happened in the, in the nation if he would have been killed? But he didn't die, but still the first shot was uh, taken at Trump, and it is the civil war that we are simply seeing unfolding. Together with you, I want to look at the future of America, and we are going to look at history, and we are going to look at Bible prophecy to see where the world is headed, and especially America's destiny. We begin this presentation going to a man by the name of Martin Armstrong, who has been a fascinating analyst, whom some people look up to, and some people, they just simply reject him. Now, Martin Armstrong has been using quiet uh, analysis, which is complicated to say the least, through the computer models uh, that he has been using about what is going to happen at these particular years. And so 2016, his computer models saw that there would be the rise of an insurgency presidential candidate akin to a third party. And in other words, a party realignment which just so happened to be Republican. And then in 2024, he was basically saying that it, there will not be, the, the, the election will not be accepted by either side and that it may be the last presidential election in American history. For 2024 and 2025, uh, the models have been predicting civil unrest in the nation and election in 2028 may not even happen. So Martin Armstrong is basically looking at all the developments and all the data and all the information and, and, and he's seeing that something big is about to happen. Now on his website, he said on the 20th of March 2024 that this year 2024 begins a sharp change in sentiments and a directional change followed by a major turning point in 2025. That's what we are going to look at today. Now, I just want to put it out to you quickly that we are not date settings. We are not putting events or certain turning points and saying that it must happen in that particular time. But still, the analysts, the historians, as we are going to see, are seeing changes taking place in our society as never before. And he's saying that a, a major turning point is something that we are going to see. He also said in his analysis of the time between 2024 to 2032, 
is that we are looking at the collapse of Republican forms of government. So in other words, the way the country is structured, with time, we are going to see the democratic demolition of it. And it's fascinating when we are looking at the analysis of Martin Armstrong and recognizing of what is happening in Venezuela. Just a couple of days ago, the socialist uh, party is said to have won the election, but the opposition doesn't want to accept the election results. So there is now turmoil in the country. And I've been watching the history, or rather the news, and, and thinking of historical patterns of what has been, and also connecting it to our present time with America. I was thinking to myself, do we actually see what happens in Venezuela right now, what we will see in November? After all, Martin Armstrong said the 2024 election, nobody is going to, if this side wins, the other side is not going to accept it. Are, what we see in Venezuela, is that just a precursor of what we will see in November? Time will tell. Now let me draw your attention to a book called The Fourth Turning. An American Prophecy. This book was published in 1997. So this is before the 9-11 time. This is before the financial crash of 2008. And these historians, two historians that are absolutely fascinating hypotheses that, ha that they have put forth, is that history seems to go in cycles. Well, we are progressing forward, but it is going forward in cycles. And these cycles are 80 to 100 years where you could uh, divide the cycle into four particular time periods. Now we're going to go and look into those four parts of the cycles, but it is absolutely amazing how these historians are putting forth this hypothesis, which they say that we can go back at least 500 years in Anglo-Saxon world, in, from Europe and onwards to America, and see patterns repeated. Now, they are saying that there are, this is a book that turns history into prophecy. And this, the, that history is cyclical is these four phases. There is the high, which is the renaissance to community life. What I Usually when I'm explaining uh, this time period, it is basically a time when most, if not all, of society is agreeing upon a major elements that are important. So on moral issues, on spiritual issues, and so on and so on, that, that there is a, a unity among people in society. But that status quo is challenged, usually by the younger generation, to which the historians Strauss and Howe are calling the awakening. So here we have a dramatic challenge against the high assumption of society. New spiritual and social ideals burst forth. And as a consequence, society is now unraveling because a certain segment of society embraces the culture of forces, but other ones want to remain in the status quo. And this leads to culture wars because there are a group of people that are resistant to it, and which eventually leads to the crisis. Arise in response to sudden threats previously ignored or deferred, but which are now perceived as dire. And that is the end of crisis. And they call it the death of an old order and the rebirth of something new. So here you have the four phases in a cycle which they are saying usually lasts 80 to 100 years and after that you have the four phases again and a new cycle and a new cycle and a new cycle. And they have shown pretty interesting, um, how, how, how should we say it, looking back into history, finding the right patterns and as historians also seeking to predict of where the world, and especially America, is about to go. Now, 
How can we offer this prophecy, they say, with such confidence? They say because it's all happened before many times. And here you have the turnings going all the way back to the 400s, in the late 400s, in the early parts of the 1500s, you have the cycle going and you have the same thing. So if we look at the awakening cycle, we have the Protestant Reformation and then a cycle later we have the Puritan awakening and then the Great Awakening, then the Transcendental Awakening, which interestingly enough ends in 1844, which I believe is a prophetic date. But then you have the Third Great Awakening and then the Consciousness Revolution, which they call the first awakening, the first spiritual revival, which was a non-Christian in the western part of the world that had global impact. So basically you have the cycles and the cycle always ends in a crisis. So whether it's the Armada crisis, the Glorious Revolution, the American Revolution, the Civil War and the Great Depression, they always end in a crisis. So you have the cycles as I told you and now we're going to look at the cycle where we are at the moment. So imagine yourself that you are as a society you have just gone through the Great Depression and the Second World War and now America which won the Second World War is becoming the, the, the leading country of the world, the most powerful nation in the world, military, economically, powerful allies all over the world and United States leads the world forward. And so you have in this cycle what the historians are calling the American height from 46 to 64. And the American high is a time of society where there is a high morality. There is a consensus, a unity upon the most important things in life. So there is a consensus. But the status quo, interestingly enough, was challenged by the younger generation who became the hippie. Uh, generation who became the con part of the consciousness uh, revival taking place in the 60s up until the 80s. But what is it that makes it interesting is that the society is now becoming polarized and then we come into the uh, third part, the culture war part, which they call it, from 84 to 2005, they put a question mark because remember the book was published in 1997, but what they are basically saying there is that society since then has been going through this culture war. There are those who are wanting to follow traditional values and then there are those who want to come with new values. I hope that as you are listening listening to this, that you are starting to realize how the West has been changing. And yes, we are going to look at Donald Trump and we are going to look at the prophetic future of America, but we have to understand how come the nation and the Western world for that matter is in this part, in, is in this state, is in this spiritual moral condition. Well, there is the culture war two segments and what you're basically saying and what the historians are saying is that society as you come into the third cycle third phase of the cycle rather that there is the polarization of society where the center is basically left completely there are people on the right there are people on the left there are people that are following traditional values there are people that want to follow the new moral values and it is polarizing and it is especially going to be seen in politics now my question to you is is that what we are seeing that is exactly what we are seeing we are seeing the polarization of society not just in America but all around the world. In my country, here in Finland where, where I live and I'm from Sweden, we see the polarization as never before. It's a global phenomena. It's because we are entering, we have entered into the last part of the phase 
which according to the historians is the millennial crisis. And they are basically saying is that in this part, something is going to trigger it. Did you remember what Martin Armstrong said? There will be a major turning point. Now this is the turning point. This is the fourth turning. Something of previous crisis events is going to happen in our world where the old order is going to die and a new one is going to come. Now in order to quote, this is what they are saying, that the next fourth turning is due to begin shortly after the new millennium. They say around the year 20, 2005, but historians who are in the analyzing what they are saying, and they themselves say it came 2008 with the financial crash. A sudden spark will cataclyze a crisis mood. Remnants of this old social order will disintegrate. Political and economic trust will implode. Real hardship will beset the land with severe distress that could involve questions of class, race, nation, and empire. Yet this time of trouble will bring seeds of social birth. Americans will share a regret about recent mistakes and a resolute new consensus about what to do. The very survival of the nation will feel at stake. Sometime before the year 2025, America will pass through a gate in history commensurate with the American Revolution, Civil War, and twin emergencies of the Great Depression and World War II. So basically, as we are soon, probably, going to experience this crisis event, it is going to be a new birth for the nation, and that the previous polarization, the previous division is going to be undone and instead a new order has come up. And uh, interestingly enough, not only these historians but other historians and thinkers and philosophers and occultists have been predicting that something is going to happen around the time of 2025. Fascinating insights. Now, we are uh, Victor Davis Hansen, born Tucker Carson, that we are in the middle of a revolution. And he says the next 12 months will be the most explosive in history. I think he's right. Now, they say that many despair that values that were new in the 1960s are today so entwined with social dysfunction and cultural decay that they can no longer lead anywhere positive. Through the current unraveling era, that is probably true. Remember, that's when they are writing the book. But in the crucible of crisis, that will change. This will require, listen to this, a value consensus and to administer it, the empowerment of a strong new political regime. So what they are basically saying is that as we are entering into the new cycle, the last cycle is gone, and from the crisis we are entering into, they are basically saying what? A value consensus is, all, is going to be, and, and it has to be administered through a power political regime. So the question is, what has this to do with America's future. What will happen, happen to democracy? What will happen to the forms of government? Now it's interesting if you look at other theories of where America is headed and likewise the western part of the world that you have probably heard if not about the black swan theory. Now that is a theory of events and it is a metaphor used to describe an event that comes as a surprise. And it has a major effect. And is often inappropriately rationalized after the fact with the benefit of hindsight. The term is based on a Latin expression which presumed that black swans did not exist. So basically, this theory is saying that certain cataclysmic events might happen and the way people are not only interpreting the event but the way they are trying to 
survive after this, the way they are trying to solve the situation that ha might have come about, is what the Wikipedia uh, and, uh, definition says, it is inappropriately rationalized and it may have severe consequences due to it being an extreme rarity, severe impact, and the widespread insistence that they were obvious in hindsight. In other words, when you are looking back, once the event has happened, people are like, how could we have not seen it? That's what it basically says. So are we towards a third world war? Are we towards a nuclear apocalypse? Are we towards a crisis of apocalyptic measures as it comes to a financial crisis? What about the environment that we are seeing collapsing all over the world? In other words, we might not have only one kind of an event, we may even have several events happening at the same time approximately leading to complete dysfunction of society. Now, in this presentation, I have now presented to you the fourth turning, setting the stage. In other words, we are seeing all over that something is boiling, something is cooking, and it doesn't look good. The polarization that we see in society is as bad as it probably can get, but trust me, it can get worse. And the question, as I have asked several times now, is what is going to happen. That is what we are going to go through in the rest of this presentation. And what I'm going to present to you in the next couple of minutes is what the book of Revelation has to say, especially in chapter 13, about the prophetic future of America. And we are going to look at the Adventist scenario of end time events. Now, I am an ordained pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have been a baptized member of the Adventist Church since 2011. And the, the way I came to Jesus, the way I came to Christ, was through Bible prophecy. And what is absolutely amazing is that the Adventist scenario of the end times is exactly what we are seeing in the world today. So what is it? Basically, in the book of Revelation chapter 13, there are two superpowers that we are getting into, basically are described for us. And these superpowers are going to unite at the end of time, just before the return of Jesus. And what they are going to do is that they are going to legislate morality and worship upon all the world. And here we have the context for the mark of the beast. Now, this is the overview. In Revelation 13, 1 to 10, we are, we are invited to look into this apocalyptic beast who is called the Antichrist or the man of sin in other parts. And the way we can identify who this power is, is that the very details that the Revelation 13 gives us about a lion, a bear, a leopard, and this dragon is actually used in Daniel chapter 7. So in other words, if we understand the book of Daniel, especially Daniel chapter 7, we can understand who this beast power is in Revelation chapter 13. And the, we have a sequence of kingdoms because these beasts, these animals are symbolized by empires, by superpowers that have come chronologically after one another. We have Babylon and Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. And Daniel chapter 7 says that out of the fourth beast, a little horn would come up and the little horn is the same as the beast power in Revelation 13. An Adventist, together with many other Protestants, by the way, have correctly identified that the first superpower that we read in Revelation 13 is the papacy. And this is amazing. Uh, 
Because prophecy says in verse 3 and 4 that just before Jesus returns, although this power might have received a deadly wound, the deadly wound is going to get healed. And the Bible says that all the world will wonder after the beast. But how is that going to happen? Revelation 13 gives us the answer because it is in chapter 13, verses 11 to 18, that we are describing uh, this uh, power that looks like a lamb but speaks like a dragon. Let me ask you, in the book of Revelation, and actually all throughout the Old and New Testament, who does the lamb symbolize? It is none other than Jesus, right? But here we have a power that comes onto the scene and will become a super major power that is going to eventually cooperate with the papacy, with the Roman Catholic Church, and it is described as a lamb-like beast, which tells me that this power is, has something to do with Jesus. This power has something to do with at least claiming to be Christ-like. But prophecy says it speaks like a dragon. All throughout the book of Revelation, especially chapter 12, verse 9, the Bible says that the dragon is none other than Satan. So here we see the great controversy between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. Here we see that this nation, claiming to be Christ-like, a lamb-like beast, is actually speaking like a dragon. And if we would have more time, we would see that in prophecy, the way a nation speaks is speaking through its legislation. So the, the, the very legislation that comes is coercive. It is satanic, but all doing this in the name of Jesus Christ. It's also called the false prophet and Adventist have identified the second power as the United States of America, but it's not just America is in the totality of a government, but it's a religious element that has been identified as fallen apostate Protestantism. And the steps of end time events, according to Revelation 13, is if you read in verse 13 and onwards, is like this. The Bible says that fire from heaven will come down upon people. And if you interpret it symbolically, which I believe the book of Revelation should be done, that it, we see that it is supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles that is taking place, leading to a spiritualism and a false revival. Now, the spiritualism and the false revival leads people to become deceived. Why? Because it's not the spirit of truth that has come upon the people. It is the spirit of deception that has come upon the people. And what happens as people are being deceived by this global revival? Now, I believe that there will be a true revival, a godly revival at the end of time. But just as God pours out his Holy Spirit, Satan is going to pour out his spirit. And what is so remarkable with this understanding is that this revival is not going to be outside of Christianity. This is going to be inside Christianity of people claiming to be followers of Jesus Christ, but they have been deceived. Now, prophecy continues to say that as people have been deceived, they are going to create the image of the beast, and that is going to lead to the mark of of the beast. Why is this important? You see, many times people are looking at fulfillment of Bible prophecy and looking at how close is actually the return of Jesus. And people are saying that, oh, because the mark of the beast has not come yet, we can chill out. We can rest. We, can, we don't have to do anything. We can just rest and take it easy. But we have to understand that there, is, there are steps, there is a process of events leading to the mark of the beast. And if we can uh, discover that process, we are going to see the, the, how it is going to lead to the mark. The mark of the beast is basically the very 
last product. It is the result, basically. And that's what we are going to look at. The um, America has been prophesied in Bible prophecy. Trust me, it is powerful, powerful news. But this nation, which has for many, many years and been a nation that has respected uh, religious liberty, liberty of conscience, as we are going to see. Something is going to change. A process is going to occur, and people are going to build the so-called image of the beast. Now, what's the image of the beast? It's very easy. The image of the beast is basically a replica of what the first beast was like. Remember in the creation story, the Bible says that humanity was created in the what? In the image of what? God, exactly. It's in the image of God. And that doesn't mean that humanity was God. It simply meant that humanity was supposed to be a reflection of who God is. Same thing at the end of times. In this false revival, in Protestant America, especially as we are going to see, and that is going to go global, by the way, now this is going to lead to a building of a replica of the first beast. So the question is, who, who is the first beast? That's the papacy. How was the papacy ruling during the Dark Ages? It did it by the unity of church and state. So if you can get up to the PowerPoint, presentation here, you can see that the image of the beast in Adventist scenario has been the unity of church and state. So in other words, the new world order, so to speak, is not necessarily, or not necessarily, it is not a secular godless government. It is instead the opposite where the church is going to unite with the state as it was during the Middle Ages, and it is going to lead to the mark of the beast. Now, what's the mark of the beast? Now, the beast, the papacy, as we have discovered, the Bible says it has a mark. Now, interestingly, that in the Old Testament, the Bible says that God also has a special mark. God also has a special sign. God also has a special kind of seal of authority. And that is the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. And that is nothing else than the seventh day Sabbath. And Bible prophecy predicted in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 that the, uh, the papal power would actually change times and laws. What, what, what it basically says there is that the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments, which falls on the seventh day, on Saturday, would by the papacy, after Jesus and after the apostles, be changed and become the Sunday. The Jesus didn't change the Sabbath. The apostles this is, didn't change the Sabbath either. It came much later through the papacy. And so the mark is basically the enforcement of religious law which leads to persecution of everybody who do not pay homage to the mark of the beast, to the special seal of authority of the papacy. In other words, it is the judicial enforcement of Sunday as a national day of rest leading to persecution of Sabbath keepers and anti-Sabbath laws. In a nutshell, I have presented to you the Adventist scenario of the end of times. In Protestant America, there's going to be a political movement, a religious movement that is going to come closer and closer and closer together, so much so that a image is going to be set up, a unity of church and state is going to occur, and it will eventually result in enforcing Sunday upon all people. I know that if it's the first time that you are hearing this, that you are probably thinking, what am I that I'm listening to? But Adventists have been very careful in on how they have presented it. In this wonderful book, The Great Controversy, which has this powerful uh, subtitle here under, Will Two Former Rivals Unite? Speaking, of course, 
about the Vatican, the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, and Protestant America. And, and the, the author of the book, Ellen White, says that when the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. She continues to say that the image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. Listen very carefully. Now, some people, when they are reading this, they think to themselves, ah, who cares? This is not even happening. I'm going to show to you that this is happening right before our very eyes. And this presentation is going to be a long presentation, but at least we have all the material covered so you know where to go if you want to go back and, and, and listen to it again or tell people you should li really listen to that part of the presentation. Look at the process. The churches are uniting upon common points. Number one, that is going to lead to a, an alliance in which they are going to go to the what? The, the what? Tell me. Come on. The state to enforce legislation. She doesn't go into what the legislation is, but, Im but this unity of church and state will inevitably lead to the persecution of those who do not fall into the mainstream. That's how it always has been. And Protestants especially should know from their history when church and state unites. That's why Protestants have championed religious liberty, liberty of conscience, free speech, and many of these wonderful individual rights, as we are going to see later on, which is under attack, not only by the left, but as I'm going to show you, up from the right as well. Second point. Ellen White is so prophetic in her describing here is that it says that when the Protestant churches, if we go back and see the previous quote that we read, she said that when the leading churches of the United States, why is this, why is this important? It is because somebody might say, will America legislate an established church or religion. That is not going to happen. That's not what Ellen White says. That is not the Adventist scenario. The Adventist scenario is not that there is, there is going to be this established only one church that people have to follow. She says that when the leading churches come together and when the leading churches unite, they are forming a religious and political alliance. You see? And they are going to go to the state. And this is what Adventists have understood as the image of the beast. This is going to be very important, as we will see in a couple of minutes. Let me read to you another quote from Testimonies to the Church, written in 1885. She says, By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. Listen to this. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. The papacy is going to unite with Protestantism, but it is going to unite with spiritualism. And as this revival is taking place under this threefold union, we just read that every principle of the Constitution as a Protestant and Republican, what? Government is going to be repudiated. Interesting that Martin Armstrong had a similar insight into this. 
And that is what the Adventist scenario has been looking like. Now, Donald Trump is a fascinating man, and he is running for office again for the second time to become the president of the United States. I am not telling you if you are an, are an American citizen, if you are to vote for him or vote against him. That is up to you and to your conscience. But what I'm presenting to you is that we are seeing prophecy being fulfilled. Listen to what Trump said for a particular event for national religious broadcasters where pro pastors and priests and re other religious leaders assembled. Ladies and gentlemen, with your help and God's grace, the great revival of America begins on November 5th, 2024. Be able to do it because you're the people we want to hear from the pastors and the ministers and the rabbis the people in this room are the people we want to hear from and they have to have a political voice you know if you think about it you have men you have women and you have religion if you look at it you have more than the men you have more than the women you have such power but you really you weren't allowed to use that power and you're now allowed to use it. I get in there, you're going to be using that power at a level that you've never used it before. It's going to bring back the churchgoer. I mean, you have to see. I don't like the charts when I see charts where they're going in the wrong direction. We don't like that. We're going to bring it back. And I really believe it's the biggest thing missing from this country. It's the biggest thing missing. We have to bring back our religion. We have to bring back Christianity in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I make you a simple promise. In my first term, I fought for Christians harder than any president has ever done before. You know that. You know that. And I will fight even harder for Christians with four more years in the White House. We did things that uh, the likes of which nobody has ever done for Christians in this country, and I'm very proud of that and honored by it. So evangelists like the late, great Pat Robertson, who is a great gentleman, got to know him very well. Trump is speaking to these uh, religious leaders, and he's saying that there is going to come a revival. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. But he is basically saying that we are going to do something about the situation in which we are in. And if you vote for me, I am going to give Christians a power that they have never had before. What we are seeing here, my friends, is the, what I said, the process of events, which is unfolding before our eyes. And we are seeing this scenario taking place. And it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. In the book, Great Controversy, we read that the papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike accept the form of godliness without the power. And they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. Here we have papists, Protestants, and secular people are going to join this movement and they are it is going to be popular it is going to be such a movement that people cannot resist or people cannot stand against it now how has this happened let me tell you a little bit of historical background to how we have come here now with an understanding of the cycles remember the cycle that i told you a couple of minutes ago with the four phases right what happened during the 60s is that a non-Christian revival occurred in America and in the western part of the world. And what it did was that it challenged the traditional values of Christianity, which has been the bedrock and foundation for American society for many, many generations. And what you had as a consequence is Christians reacting to this. Now, there are philosophers and there are academics 
who are basically saying that there, are, there is a Hegelian dialectic. What, what, what you are seeing here is that you have the type and then you have the anti-type and as these two are rubbing themselves together, there is going to come the synthesis. So what came as a result? Now you had the traditional values, you have the, this, uh, let's say, new age revival or the uh, things of that nature. And so Christians, they had to, they felt reacting. And so here we see on the, on, on the page here that the rise of the modern Christian religious right in the U.S. came as a counter reaction to the ideologies of the so-called new age awakening of the 60s and 70s. So if you are old enough or well versed in this topic, you probably recognize the name. Jerry Falwell, Robert Grant, Pat Robertson, James Dobson are the people that blade this ideology. And then we have Paul Weichrich and Edwin Fuhlner creates in 1973 a conservative think tank called the Heritage Foundation. Put it on your minds. We will come back to it at the end of the presentation. And during the 80s, Ronald Reagan's presidency was pivotal for the Christian right in American politics because that was the time of the culture wars, the upheaval which has been taking place and now we are in the crisis. So you have the polar polarization where you have those of traditional values going towards the political right, let's call it that way. And then those who are embracing this new form of morality where it is not the traditional conservative but the more liberal one, they are embracing the the left, if we can use these, uh, this spectrum. And the center which has existed before is, sim is simply non-existent. That's where it leads to. Now what has happened because of this is that secularism for, became for Christians the greatest enemy and the greatest threat to America. As a consequence, this threat united both conservative Christians, conservative Protestants, and conservative traditional Catholics because they said that secularism must be defeated. And the question is, will the future of American government be godless, secular, or theocratic? Now the Adventist scenario is very clear. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees. Now, what is secularism? Secularism can be understood as two, it, it, you, you can give two explanations to it. Secularism can be a form of government, but in, in that sense, uh, the current nations in Europe are considered secular. There is a separation of church and state that came about in the 1700s, the 1800s and onwards. But if we talk about secularism as a culture, then we recognize that secularism has this mix of beliefs that is other than Christian. And it is usually non-theistic. It may be pagan, it may be non-religious, but it's these beliefs as meta or not meta-narratives, but as dominant narratives in the culture that becomes the secular culture. And so when we are now going to go through how come the political right with the religious right, especially in the MAGA, in the Make America Great movement, is seeing this powerful unity of, of church and state coming together, we must recognize that as they are talking about secularism, they are usually conflicting the two. Because they say secularism sometimes is the form of government and sometimes the culture. Now let me say this. I am a strong supporter of a secular form of government. I thank God for the separation of church and state because whenever church and state has united in history, it has always led to the persecution of those who have 
other thoughts, disagreements, dissenters, as we saw in the great controversy. Now, I do not agree with secular culture, you see? So that's why we have to see through when the arguments are being presented. In 1994, evangelicals and Catholics together toward a common mission. This was a time, especially in America, a very particular event which combined several theologians and philosophers and religious leaders to discuss how do we stand ecumenically evangelicals and Catholics. And this is what it said in the book. Growing out of a historic seminar in the spring of 1994, this bold statement with its probing questions admits the deep differences in Roman Catholic and evangelical attitude towards the church, papal authority, and the sacraments. So in other words, doctrinally speaking, 30 years ago, the evangelicals, they were distant from the papacy. But listen to this. The, the unity between the two must happen. That's the scenario. That's what we have been seeing so far. So if it is not going to be based upon necessary biblical doctrines, what other doctrines can unite? Well, if the secular culture presents certain beliefs in the area of morality, then could it be that there, that there is a unity upon moral doctrines? Listen to this. But it also holds that with more openness and more clarity about continuing doctrinal differences, enough common ground can be found to engage the larger enemy of skepticism that threatens the country's foundation. So there is a common ground, and it's a common mission. But what's the common mission? The common mission is not the preaching of the gospel. Because evangelical gospel and the Catholic gospel are two, uh, is basically two different messages. One says we are justified by faith. The other says we are justified by faith and works. And there are many, many other doctrinal issues which we could say that there is no common mission. But listen, there is an enemy where, where Protestantism and Catholicism were enemies against each other. Now with this other enemy of secularism, skepticism, that is trying to change the culture of the nation through these certain beliefs that is trying to give a new worldview to people, now we have a common mission. And it has to be done not only uh, spiritually, but especially politically. The common mission as we see in the 1994 and, of course, onwards, is a political mission that evangelicals and Catholics are on. 20 years later, in 2014, <coughs> you had the evangelical leaders, many of them, James Robinson and others, Kenneth Copeland, together with the man in white. Pope Francis was meeting with them and they were discussing what can we together, what can we do together on this common mission that we all have. And they were basically saying with the leading of Tony Palmer that the protest is over. The protest is over. Why are you Protestants anymore? Why are you not Catholics? So prophetic prophecy was indeed fulfilling. And this is what I've been trying to allude to in several of my comments before, but basically the pendulum is swinging all the time, all the time. And remember, during the Dark Ages, the pendulum had been swinging so much to conservatism, so much to religion, so much to the church, so much to all of that, that eventually, because of the oppressive power of the church, as unity of church and state had occurred, it was so interesting that as the uh, Enlightenment period came, 
the 1700s and the 1800s, the pendulum in the western part of the world has been swinging it all the way back to ultra-liberalism. Fascinating stuff. Absolutely fascinating stuff. And the ultra-liberalism is something that we are going to come back to several times in this presentation.